it's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to The Double Stop. I'm Brian Sore. This week on the show, I've got an interview with producer Spencer Proffer. I think most people who listen to the show probably know him most for his producing work with Quiet Riot and perhaps Wasp and Kickaxe, but he'd worked on a ton of projects before the 80s, including Tina Turner and Billy Thorpe. He's still very active and has a wide range of projects on the go. From talking to him, I found him to be very passionate, very high energy. In fact, I never had to say so little in an interview. <laughs> This week is the story of Spencer Proffer, a producer who's not afraid to go against the grain, and as you'll learn, he's not afraid to put his money where his mouth is. Okay, I am a rock refugee. My parents were... (laughs) My parents are immigrants from Poland. My musical training as a young boy growing up in Germany was zip. Came to America and uh, moved to Los Angeles when I was 10 and got involved in the music sphere, being very influenced and taken by the British invasion and music that really rang my bell, clearly Lennon McCartney, but all the stuff that came from England, whether it be the Stones, the Animals, you know, even Herman's Hermits, I thought were quite charming. So um, I learned how to play guitar. My best friend was very wealthy. I was very poor. And I used to go to his house and pick up an acoustic guitar, which his sister had. He played piano. And we would kind of write our own melodies to Beatle lyrics. We would write our own lyrics to Beatle melodies. And when we got to UCLA at the age of, we were both 17, my buddy Jeff and I, We won a talent contest called Spring Sing with some stuff we made up. And that really got my Jones going into being creative. And we got a little record contract to make some demos for Capitol Records, the home of the Beatles and the Beach Boys. At 17. Yeah, it's at the age of 17. This is me in 1966. Been doing this for a while. (laughs) And... um, I got a real buzz going into the studio. We made up our own stuff. We made these demos, and they were stupid. But by the time I was 20, through various you know steps in the process, a girl I was dating who worked for Don Costa, who was Sinatra's arranger, so I used to do chord charts for him, I really got swept up in the magic of music. And I graduated UCLA at 20. I went to law school because my parents wanted me to, and we were so poor that I figured I'd have something to fall back on, although music was really in my, you know, in my DNA. And my band at the time with my buddy Jeff, we had, we were on our third record deal, and we wound up, I wound up getting 20 songs recorded of things that Jeff and I wrote by third parties, from Gary Lewis and the Playboys to Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. Even though that never made it to his Whipped Cream and Delights album, we actually got it recorded. So I started being able to support my folks and, you know, work my way through law school in our band and met Clive Davis at the time that uh, we were signed to Columbia Records as a recording uh, group. We would, I would write, arrange, and produce the music with my buddy Jeff. And I, uh, in my second year of law school, I was offered a job to move to New York upon graduation work for Clive. Well, since I couldn't sing very well, and I was pretty much a lame pop producer, I moved to New York, and my first gig was working under the umbrella of Clyde Davis, which was one of the greatest mentorship experiences of my life. I was 23 years old. I passed the bar in the sky, California, to do that. But I was rocking. My hair was down on my shoulders, and I was really, you know, I was rocking real hard. So I worked there for a couple of years. And my dad had some physical ailments. I moved back to L.A. I became the worldwide head of A&R and creative at United Artists when Transamerica owned it. And I started going left to center then. We brought over a band called ELO from England. I had gone around, I'd gone around the world looking for music that didn't sound like the stuff that was on the radio. That was the start of my crazy period. And um, when Ike and Tina, who I had inherited on the roster, 
opened for the Stones way back in 1974, I had an epiphany that Tina rocked really hard. (laughs) And Ike, you know, Ike being who he was, didn't get it. And I said to Ike, man, your demographic isn't just the Chitlin circuit, man. Your demographic is rock and roll. And I made a deal with him to, if he would let me produce um, Tina, and I would not recoup the costs, and I would want to do something in rock. Well, the compromise was he wrote a song, which is Brown Sugar, and uh, started up sideways called Baby Get It On. And we went in the studio, and a buddy of mine and I arranged and produced that track. It was a big R&B hit. So that gave me the cred to talk Ike into when Tina auditioned for Tommy, that this guy, Mike Metaboy, who's running the film studio, actually hooked up for us. When Tina got that role as the Acid Queen, I, I got the blessing to actually put that record together. And I did in 1975. Ray Parker and I were the only guys to play guitar on it. I did not use Ike's band. And that was kind of the beginning of me doing things that the other guy wouldn't do. You know, taking this great singer and changing genres for her, putting her to rock and roll singing, Pete Townsend. It's pretty cool. I stayed at UA until Transamerica sold the company, went out on my own, and the first record that I made was, I, I had met this guy, Billy Thorpe, socially, and Billy was like the Springsteen of Australia. He had come to America to seek fame and fortune you know, out of Australia. The guy was the biggest deal there. He could sell out 20,000 seaters in a heartbeat. And I met him socially, and we, we just got along really well. I loved Billy. I loved him as a person, and we became really close friends. We actually made four records together. And uh, we went and, you know, we went to this party. We were at this party, and it was so boring. We said, let's get out of here. And we went and saw Close Encounters. And the last scene in Close Encounters had aliens make contact with the Earth, and then you didn't know what happened. So when Billy and I left, we said, hey, this is pretty tripped out. Let's, let's go back to my house. Um, you know, opened a bottle of wine, picked up a couple of guitars, and we started creating this fictional story of a race from another galaxy who offered everybody on Earth the choice of staying or leaving. We were going through major political skirmishes with Afghanistan and Soviet Union, so we kind of said the Earth was going to blow up. And after our, we finished our bottle of cognac and we started on other substances, we really had everybody who was left on Earth kind of go off into a crystal ship uh, with, with these aliens called the Children of the Sun to a new planet. By the time we finished the song, everybody split. By the time the album was done, the Earthlings had gone to another planet, colonized, and started a new race. Pretty tripped out. Well, I had produced some legit records, not, not that Billy was illegit, but, you know, pop records. I, I had done some work with Alan Clark from the Hollies and done some work for Polygram in Europe while I went out on my own as an independent producer. And I got enough money from Polydor International, so I built a recording studio called Pasha, and I spent 11 months making the Children of the Sun album with Billy. We, got, we connected with a guy named Alvin Taylor, who used to play for George Harrison, played drums, and Leland Sklar, who's one of the great bass players of all time, left working for Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and James Taylor. He joined us, and the, the three of them, the trio, we made the Children of the Sun record, engineered by a guy who's still in my life named Larry Brown, who's become a major film composer. And we spent 11 months, I synced up two 24-track machines, Billy and I wrote Children of the Sun, and I couldn't give it away. We shopped it for shit nine months. Every label president turned it down. And coming off the Tina Turner album, I thought I'd have a little bit of you know juice in the business. But the one thing you learn about the record business, you're as good as the last record you made. So all the label, you know, I had just finished building Pasha, so we lit candles, burned incense, turned the lights down. I invited all the A and R geniuses and all the label heads that I could to the studio. Every single person passed, literally, all the majors, all the minors, all the indies, everybody. I met Phil Walden and Frank Fenter, who had a little independent label out of Macon, Georgia, called Capricorn, and they were pretty tripped out guys, and they had just come off some big hits with the Allman Brothers and the Marshall Tucker Band, the Dixie Dregs. They dug this record. They dug it a lot, and we, you know, we heard it the right way, no lights, candles, incense, substance, and they got it. So we put the record out on Capricorn, 
And lo and behold, every station in America that had the balls to play it, because the single, Children of the Sun, was a six minute and 40 six minutes and 40 seconds single with spaceships flying left and right. Google it, listen to it. It's like the number three most recurrent still 37 years later from um, on Sirius Deep Tracks. Anyway, the bottom line is the record went to number one in the rock charts. It became the most requested record at rock radio. And Billy and I thought, how cool. Let's do something celestial. I met some guys up at, at, who were doing Griffith Park laser shows, and I talked them into putting up the money to do a computer animation laser choreography of the album so that we could you know you got a buck off when you went to Griffith Park and if you bought the album uh, you got a buck off when you went there and you got a buck off on the album the other way this is way before this is 1978 way before cross marketing became the vogue and it just exploded the record was like on fire we got almost to a million units imagine that in 1978 you know, that would be 20 million today. Then Phil Walden got sued by the Allman Brothers for embezzling some money. The record was number one in the rock charts, 39 in Billboard, and the company filed for bankruptcy. You couldn't get a Children of the Sun record to save your life, and we lost the moment. We made a follow-up record. I made a deal at Electra Asylum. We made a follow-up record called 21st Century Man. Anyway, lost the moment, but the song ultimately... Sony got a hold of the Masters. I had a label deal there. I wound up remixing it. We put out a CD. We did about another 80,000, 90,000 units on it. It's still today one of the great rock records, I believe, of all time, very accoladed, and something I am proud of and I will be legacy-wise for the rest of my life. Um, that was really the start of my independent producer career way back in 78 when I set up Pasha and you became aware of me with Quiet Riot. That was 1981. So that was, Billy was the first artist that I brought over to Pasha when I made the deal with Walter Yetnikoff and Tony Martell. And it was way left of center. Nobody got it. Nobody got Billy. And I had lost a space craze moment because Galactica, and Star Wars and you know Carl Sagan's Cosmos, all that stuff had kind of peaked by the time I made my label deal. And the reason I got a label deal was I was this creative left of center pirate that the big corporation thought would be real interesting to get a guy like me to discover talent, nurture it, and put it through the system. Little did I know that they never paid attention. And I was driving around LA doing working on an Eddie Money single as a day job trying to make a few bucks and I heard come on feel the noise on the radio on KHJ radio which was a pop station and it was sandwiched in between Roxanne by the police one of the great records of life and soft cell um, tainted love but it jumped out of the radio and the Slade version from 1972 just hit me and I said to myself holy shit if I could find a band to sing that song that was anthem participatory rock. It invited people to participate. Come on, feel the noise. Girls rock your boys. You know? Then I might be able to get CBS to pay attention to me because they didn't. They thought I was nuts. I used to wear these silk robes and I would go come into the offices barefoot. And do you think Rick Rubin was eccentric? You didn't know me in nineteen eighty one. Fantastic. You know. I did not have a beard, but I did have long hair, and I did rock hard, and I really lived who I was. It wasn't just a guy who phoned it in. I was in the room. So, um, you know, when I heard Come On, Feel the Noise on the radio, I literally felt I needed to find a band. So I called everybody I knew in town, and they told me there was a band playing at a place called the Country Club in Reseda, rock club, called Dubrow fronted by a guy named Kevin Dubrow, and I went to see them because I was told they were very animated and they would do anthem participatory stuff. I went to see them. There was 20 people in the audience, and when I finished, when they finished their set, I went up to them and I said, hey, man, and they were singing songs like Bang Your Head. They were singing songs like Party All Night, meaning songs that it would invite you to join along. And I'm thinking to myself, holy shit, this is exactly what I had in my mind. So I went up to Kevin, who's the leader of the band, and very, very outspoken. And I said, hey, man, I said, this, this stuff is really cool. Um, my name's Spencer Proffer. I'm Kevin, who's a student of rock music. Said, Spencer Proffer, 
Weren't you that guy that did that Tina Turner album? Didn't you put her into Tommy? Didn't you play it? He like he knew my whole life story. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, that'd be me. And he said, hey, man, didn't you build a studio? I said, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you studio time. If you do a song that I think could be a hit, I'll do three of yours. I'll pay for it. I'll put, the, you know, I'll record it. I just made a label deal with CBS. I think I can put it through the system. Would you do this? Well, little did I know they had been passed on by everybody in the business. They went up and down, not only the strip, they played the Troubadour, they played the Roxy. Everybody pissed on them. So Kevin said, okay. So I made a deal with them. I did, the deal was very simple. We'll be 50-50 partners. Later, they bitched about it because they didn't appreciate that I made money, but I was able to save it. They snorted it. The big difference. But the punchline was they, they said, okay. And well, they had a guy, drummer, who I thought was the best rock drummer I'd ever heard, a guy named Frankie Benelli. Brilliant guy, talented, totally had it together. So I actually bonded a little more with Frankie than I did with Kevin. I know Kevin and Frankie were friends, but Frankie was the dude. Frankie was really highly musical, and I loved and respected his talent. So I took him in the studio. We cut those first four songs on a weekend. And I had my a guy who was actually my runner, my engineer, Larry Brown, who had engineered Children of the Sun, got ill. And so I asked this guy, Dwayne Barron, who became a major engineer, if he would just spec this with me over a weekend. Well, we did, and we cut the first four songs on mental health. I was so excited. I thought Bang Your Head could be an anthem for the time. I thought it could redefine rock radio. So I called my, my genius friends at the time, Epic, you know, it was CBS Records, and I said, I have the next band. You don't like Billy Thorpe? Okay, well, I got something that you're going to like. So I flew to New York. They set up a conference room. I played them the first four songs. I had all the promotion guys, everybody in the room. I got a note from, from one of the executives. I don't want to name him. And the note, by the time I was finishing Come On, Feel the Noise, was, Spencer, we hate this. <laughs> please, please don't make us put it out. We'll pay you for the whole album. Please do not make us put it out. It's too different, and we don't want it. Of course. So I played the four sides. I played the four sides. They all were very polite. I left the room, and then I got a call at my hotel at the plaza a couple hours later. Spencer, you know, at the time I was getting nothing. I mean, it, you know, to do a whole album was like, my deal was like $75,000 for the whole album. And so because I cut four songs, they gave me the pro rata four tenths of that. They said, we'll give you the whole 75. We'll just give it all to you. Please do not put it through. So I thought, hey, that's not bad. I just got paid for a whole album. I've only cut four sides. I went shopping. Just like my Billy Thorpe record, just like my Tina Turner thing, everybody I went to passed. Everybody passed to a man. There was one guy, John Kaladner, who I thought was brilliant. He was working at Atlantic. I had just made an Alan Clark deal with him. John kind of got it, but he didn't fully get it. And everybody told me to go away. So I later, to his credit, called two guys. I called Walter Yetnikoff, who was the chairman of, of CBS, and a guy named Tony Martell, who was the head of the custom labels. And I said, you know what, guys, you made a deal with me because you thought I had vision. Please, please, let me finish this record that all your guys hated, and let me put it out. And Walter, to his credit, said, go ahead. So I finished the album. I had the art director design the cover so that it would be a guy in a red leather straight jacket with a hockey mask, so he represented every kid. And um, I delivered the album. Well, they hated it even more because it was more of the same. So what they did is they shipped at the time, this is 1982, 83, they shipped 5,000 albums. And, they, you know, 5,000 albums. When Cindy Lauper and Michael Jackson were selling, you know, 500,000 per week, Girls Just Have Fun and Thriller, 5,000 was an insult. You'd get one record under miscellaneous Q in Omaha. But I had such great relationships that I personally made with the program directors uh, around the country who supported my Billy Thorpe record that I just, and Carol Peters, who is one of the smartest, she's now managing Hart, and she's one of the smartest, most visionary executives um, in, in the planet, and I'm still very close to Carol. She was my general manager at my company. She and I bought 10,000 records at a dollar a record, and we Federal expressed them into three markets that Thorpe had gone number one. It was KTXQ in Dallas, it was KMOD in Tulsa, and KZAP in Sacramento. Those three stations 
those three stations put on the, my album, first cut, cut one side, one bang your head. And within three days, the phones went berserk, just like they did on my Billy Thorpe record. A buddy of mine who became the head of programming at MTV, MTV was start, just started, Bob Pittman had brilliantly started MTV, and they were doing call-out research. So um, they wanted to know what was happening in local markets. Well, a guy who I was you know, socially friendly with became head of programming at MTV named Les Garland. Les called me up and he goes, hey, man, you got a really cool record happening in Texas and Oklahoma. Call, you know, this Bang Your Head record. Would you give me a video? I said, sure, I'd love to give you a video. So I called the, the, the geniuses at the label, and they said, you're at 6,000 units. When you get to 100, call us. And I said, holy shit, what do I do? I knew I had something, just like with Thorpe, just like with Tina. I kind of felt in my bones the public would resonate. So I put a second mortgage on my house, and I, I pulled out $19,000 because that's all I could get at the time. And what I did is I, I, my business card said Pasha CBS Records. So I, I thought the smartest thing I would do, I loved commercials and the short form of commercials. So I called every ad agency because I didn't know how to direct videos or produce videos. So I, I wanted to find an out-of-work video guy who could work with me to make the Bang Your Head video. And I went around and around, and I found a guy named Mark Rezica who was brilliant. I liked Fellini's Satyricon. I liked stuff that was way left to center. Mark was totally tripped out. He said he would team up with me. Then I went out to Cal Arts, which is a studio Disney had endowed out in Valencia. I went to the dean and I said, hey, man, Spets Proffer, CEO of the CBS label, right? <laughs> and I'm going to make a video. I need to use your students. I need to use your facilities. I went to the gym, and the guy said, okay. So I could get all his students who wanted to do visual films in this to work for me for nothing. Me and Resica put it together. I came up with the idea of bringing the album cover to life. The guy needed to bang his way out of a padded room into a, a place which was the auditorium. He threw his mask out so we could clone the mask. We ultimately merchandised over a million masks. And uh, he needed to rock. He needed to bang his head. We finished the video, cost me 19000 all my cash. I bypassed the label, and I sent it directly to my buddy at MTV. He put it on the air at 3 in the morning. The phones went berserk. Four days later, he moved the rotation to midnight. The phones went berserk. 500,000 units later, my friends at CBS Epic, they were my best friends, man. You could, I couldn't do more. I couldn't do more. So fortunately, the man had a good manager, Warren Entner. We decided let's put him out with Black Sabbath during the Bang Your Head period. Once the record went gold, we said let's open it up. Let's put out Come On, Feel the Noise. Another really smart manager was a guy named Bruce Allen who managed Loverboy. And we were oh, yeah, I know him. Bruce is fantastic, really smart. He's still doing a great job between yep. Brian Adams, Michael Buble. He's really a good guy. So I remember I reached out to Bruce and I said, can we open your tour? We just had a gold record, blah, blah, blah. Come on, feel the noise feels like a hit. We opened the Loverboy tour. That record blew up. We sold 7 million albums. And it kicked Thriller out of number one. It was a record that nobody wanted to touch at the label, in the, you know, at the, at any of the lab, not only the label, but anybody in the industry. So I've kind of in my career, that's just that chapter since you said Quiet Right. I've been going left to center my whole career. I'm older now. I'm doing it with various media projects. A movie I, I, I worked on, I was a co EP on Gods and Monsters. Nobody ever wanted to go near that. We won an Academy Award. Broadway show, I produced the cast album as one of the producers that ain't nothing but the blues. Four Tony nominations. Couldn't give it away for seven years in repertory. But when we got to Broadway, it was so cool that it was the history of the blues from Africa through the Mississippi Delta to Chicago. And I had I stripped out all my Lincoln Center guys and I supplemented the performances by, you know, Randy Jackson redid all my bass parts. Randy, who's a judge on Idol, great guy. And I went around the country and I had B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Johnny Lang, Taj Mahal, Andre Crouch, replace all my Lincoln Center lame parts, and that became my cast album. So I've been way, way, way left of center my whole career, and I'm still doing it now. How much did the law degree help you then? You took it as a, as a backup plan, but when you started doing your own label, it had to be really helpful. Well, what was helpful about me going to law school was the cognitive skills I learned from that process. I've negotiated all my own deals ever since I went out on my own. 
I have great lawyers in the form of a guy named Henry Root and Lee Phillips who make sure I don't screw things up. So I can cut through and take the ball 80 yards down the field, and then I make sure that my lawyers, you know, I've saved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, and because I'm the principal and the creative, I make sure that the deals reflect what it is. It doesn't get hung up. But so my law degree has just helped me with, with, with innate skills that you learn as you go. It's not bad for a backup plan. Yeah, well, it's, it's been a front plan because I can still do that. I can, I've actually been a media consigliere to some wonderful companies, Viacom, Showtime, MTV, my friend Chris McCumber, who's now the president of USA Network. I would do a lot of deals on their behalf relating to music. I knew how to do that stuff, but then I would get involved in the creative. I would just make sure that the creative, the business reflected the creative. And when you started working with Clive at that young age, was he a big influence on you? Did you learn a lot? Huge, 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 only because he was brilliant. (laughs) He had a clear vision of what he wanted. I didn't always agree with his taste. Because that's that's why there's 31 flavors. Oh, sure. But as an as an executive, you can't find a smarter, more visionary guy. And this was during the days of Santana and Sly and Simon and Garfunkel, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Chicago. He was there, ground floor for all of those. Joplin, Dylan. Now, Clive Davis was and still is somebody I admire. And had a kid at 23 to watch this guy in action, man. Yeah, I just wanted some of that pixie dust. Now, when you started working with Quiet Riot and you did those four songs, was it the full lineup of the band? Did th- did those recordings make it to the final album, or did you re-record those four those first four songs? I record we recorded nothing. I remixed nothing. The thing that everyone in the industry passed on in the order of I'll, I'll never forget this it was Bang Your Head, Come On Feel the Noise, Don't Want to Let You Go, and Slick Black Cadillac. Those are the first four tracks on the first side of Metal Health. I made them, I mixed them, and I would mix my own records. I had engineers, but every record I've ever made, the 203 albums I've produced, I've mixed every single note on every record. And it was those four songs in that order, in those mixes, that wound up on the final record with nothing changed. And does that explain why Chuck Wright played bass on a couple songs, then Rudy did the rest, or am I wrong on that? No, no, no. Um, Rudy played on the first record, Chuck played on subsequent records. Okay, I thought Chuck played on... Metal Health and the song itself. I thought that was Chuck. I don't remember. It was Chuck was terrific, and when Rudy went back to go work with Ozzy, Chuck came in. He was a friend of Kevin's. Right. But I don't know. Maybe maybe this is too long ago. Shit, this is thirty four <laughs> years ago. I I kind of think Chuck came in for Condition Critical for the second record. I think that Rudy actually played... I know one thing. Rudy played on those first four tracks. I didn't even know Chuck Wright when I recorded those first four tracks that were supposedly demos, but they became the masters. And what led to the name change back to Quiet Riot? Because I know they had been Quiet Riot before they were Dubro. Yeah, well, Quiet Riot was the name of the band that I think they had in Japan when uh, Randy Rose right. was in the band. Yeah. And Dubro didn't sound cool enough from a marketing standpoint. I have a bad habit of having some marketing sensibility. So I just said to Kevin, you know, when I got to learn about the band and their history, and he said, well, I said, that's a great name. That's a great image. Who owns that name? He says, I do. I said, that's the name of the band, dude. <laughs> now, you mentioned that you, you, you mixed all your records, and I'm trying to figure out in your timeline, where did that skill, where did you, where did you get that skill? Being poor and having to do my own demos when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, I had to play every instrument, I had to sing, and I had to play guitar, and I had to mix it. So I got so immersed in the process that as I started making records and as I started, when I realized that there were better guitar players than me, after the Tina Turner album, after I played guitar, and I, I, I met Ray Parker and I worked with him, I said, holy shit, I got to put the guitar down. I just got to be behind the scenes. And then, you know, in my career, I've had the good fortune to work with guys like Jeff Beck and Brian May and Dave Lambert from the Straubs. Those are real guitar players. So, um, but I really hear it in my head and I just need to make sure that the records, see, producers who don't mix their records, I don't know. I'm a big believer that you got to see it through. You got to be musical, you got to understand it, and you got to put it together the way you hear it. Mixing to me is every bit as important as producing. Oh, sure. It's like editing on a film. No question. Hey, you can make a film. The editor can make or break a film. You could be a brilliant filmmaker. The editor could screw it up in the editing room. The ability to to write your own music, to play instruments, how does that help you as a producer when you're working with bands? 
being able to converse and having the cred to say, you know what, modulate this, change this, do this. Not that I was as good as any of the bands that I work with, but, and, you know, I've learned a lot every time. When I made a little river band record, those guys were so commercial, so cool. And we co-wrote the album, the Playing to Win album together in 1984. But during that process, they were so musical. I learned chords that I never knew. I could start something. They would finish it. They would give me something. And I would say, you know, but what if you did this? What if you added this? And what if you modulated here? And I think the artists liked it because I wasn't some suit talking to them. I was a cat that could really talk their talk, put my hands on it, pick up a guitar, do something, and then ultimately be immersed in it. And that's probably why I haven't made the money that a lot of my peers have made because guys that I got started with have emerged and there's some really major guys from my generation that are running you know, big organizations. I got lost in the weeds of the creative. I had to mix the records. I had to pick up the guitar. I had to change the riffs. I had to work and collaborate. I'm a, I'm a real good collaborator. And what I don't know, the artists know, but I'm a good sounding board. And that's kind of, that was a real big gas for me to be able to do that. Now, when you finished a Quiet Riot record, did you move into the next Quiet Riot record or was it over to Wasp? No, no. I did the second Quiet Riot record. I then was offered virtually every metal band you can imagine on the planet to produce. Now, I met a, socially, I met a guy named Doc Mickey, who's still my dear friend, and he was managing a band called Motley Crue. Rather than produce Motley Crue, they just loved the sound of Quiet Riot Records. So this guy, Tom Worman, who I knew from CBS, came into Pasha to make that record. I didn't really want to make any more metal records. I wanted to, to my taste for diversion. I studied classical music when I went to UCLA, and I love everything. I've made jazz records. I've made country records. You know, I just love music. So... I actually accepted a gig to go to Melbourne, Australia to produce the Little River Band. But I had met Blackie Lawless through Frankie Benelli. And Blackie was a really smart guy. And this guy had a vision, whatever it was he had. He just had a record out, a Wasp record that was a very controversial record called Fuck Like a Beast. And I thought, you know, I like this guy. He is such a Democrat. He is so far to the left. Maybe I could hone him in just a little, because I'm very left of center as well. But I thought that would be a really musical challenge. So we made the last Command album. We actually sold almost 2 million albums. That was the last, quote, metal record I made. And then I went to Australia to make a Little River Band record. To work with a metal band or the Little River Band, in terms of your process, does it change at all? No. No. The principles are the same. A song is a song. A vocal, a dynamic performance. I like telling story. I like, I like visual records. My, my Tina Turner Asset Queen album was visual. My children, the Sun record was absolutely a movie and sound. And I just like telling stories. Blackie was about that. If you listen to some of the songs on The Last Command, Blind in Texas, Widowmaker, things I remember, they're very visual. Think same thing with Little River Band. We made a song, the, the title of the album was called Playing to Win. And it was really about no matter what you do in your life, you roll the dice, you play to win. I, that process is the same, even though the musical, you know, the stripes are different. The process to me is the same. And I'm all about, you know, the goosebumps on what it takes to get whatever the artist's vision is down. So I've become a chameleon because it's very different making a B.B. King record or a Stevie Wonder record, who I've had the good fortune to work with, than it was making a Wasp record or a Quiet Riot record. And at what point did you start your transition into film? And was it a gradual one, or did you make a, a, one day decide to make a big switch? Well, I had made 200 and some odd albums by the time I was 40 years old. And, you know, record producers were really, you know, cooler guys than me were, you know, starting to bring it up. And I really, because I loved making visual statements with the music, I really wanted to make my own films where music counted. And so, you know, by the time I turned 40, a buddy of mine who be became the president of Showtime Networks, president of production, a guy named Jerry Offsay. And Jerry, one of the great human beings on the planet, actually, you know, I, I called him to congratulate him when he got the gig. And he said, you know, I'm going to change the look of this network. Will you help me change the sound of it? And I said, Jerry, I don't need a job. I don't want a job. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to make new movies where music counts. He, he said to me, and Jerry is so straight up, he goes, Schmuck, 
You don't know how to make movies. Why don't you come and help me musically with some of my movies, and when you're ready, I'll let you graduate. Well, if you IMDb me, you'll see 54 or 55 films and miniseries that I handled the music on behalf of Showtime Networks. And ultimately, I wound up, I produced eight movies there once I earned in. But I would wind up supervising, mixing the scores, writing in title songs, and really taking my music chops and applying it to visual and really learning the process. So on 54 films, I certainly learned how to put music against visual, learned the essence of how time code works, how story works, how songs work against picture. I wound up getting a chance to work on a couple of features while I was doing the Showtime thing. It wasn't a gig. I was doing it off campus. So I, I worked on Phenomenon, which was a wonderful movie that uh, John Travolta made, which had you know Clapton and Babyface teamed up to do Change the World. I was very involved in that. My friends produced the movie. And I was involved with some other stuff. I did a bunch of stuff at HBO while I was doing, funny enough, at HBO, I got involved. My kids were growing up, and it's all about my family to me. And they did an animate, they had an animated series called Happily Ever After. And I thought it was brilliant. They took classic fairy tales, and they gave them a multicultural twist. So I made a deal with HBO, Showtime's big competitor, and I was the music director of that show. So I wrote, produced, and arranged all the original music <laughs> for HBO while I was doing my Showtime movies. So, you know, we had Whoopi Goldberg as Mother Gooseberg. We had Denzel Washington as Humpty Dumpty. And Wesley Snipes was the Pied Piper. And I would bring musical people in to play the roles of the animated characters and write, arrange, and produce the music. And I did that for five years while I was doing the Showtime thing. So I really, different than all the, quote, music supervisors. I was in the trench, man. I did the work. I wrote it. I arranged it. I produced it. I mixed it. I made the deals. I made the soundtrack deal for the Happily Ever After um, album, which we did with Rhino at the time, which was a Warner company. I made the deal with getting Richard Foos, smart guy. And I would do deals on behalf of Showtime. Their business affairs people fed into me. So my law degree helped me in that those companies, be it Viacom, HBO, and, or Showtime, and Showtime actually led me into doing stuff at MTV and at VH1, all part of the Viacom system. My business chops had them a, be able to trust me so I would execute the creative and then make sure that we didn't get screwed by the, by the system. Now, it seems through all these films, like you're still very active in films, and it, it all still, as a producer, you're all still actively involved in the music. In terms of your producing side, where's the line between the two different tasks? Well, the task is the vision of the project. I will always, if I get involved in a film, and it's a film that I become the parent of and give birth to, even with partners. I'm a big believer. I love having partners. I love having financial partners and creative partners because everybody is smarter if they surround themselves with smart people. But when it comes to the music side, I kind of quarterback that but I have no problem hiring younger people who are hipper than me to execute. But I kind of know where it all goes, and I know how it's supposed to sound. So I, I draw the line in that I don't have to these days do everything like I used to. I know how to, de I know how to delegate. But if I tell somebody, you know what, remix this or move this or this doesn't work against this visual, it's not some schmuck in a suit telling them. It's somebody who's done it, done it well, done it successfully, and I do get the respect of the people I hire, but I love hiring people that are more talented than I am. And have you ever had the desire to make the, the leap over to the directing side of the film? No, because being a record producer is like being a director, but of that. There, I, that's a whole other skill set. I have worked with, I think I've worked at IMDb me on over 100 plus films. I have really seen great directors do what they do. That's a whole gig unto itself, and I don't want to reinvent myself to that. No, I love collaborating with directors. The cooler, the hipper a director, the more fun I have with it. But uh, no, I don't think I would be, maybe, maybe, I directed a bunch of videos. I think I made about 30 videos. I directed about 10 of them during that period. I had to do everything. I directed it. I produced it. It was some songs I produced. I published it. It was done in my studio. I was a crazy guy. And nobody knew that much about what I was doing because I didn't care about the limelight. I just was behind the curtain doing the work. Um, these days, 
I just want to get people who are way better than me at each gig. I just want to be on the team. I don't mind calling the plays, but the last, the, the best thing I love doing is handing the ball and passing it because, you know, 11 guys go across the goal line. I just want to be on the team. And so you've done film throughout the years, but you've also done a lot of live events and that kind of work. When did that start? It all kind of melts. To me, it's one big potpourri, just like life. You know, you're here on the planet. <laughs> yeah. for, you know, you're here and then you're not. So to me, all this stuff kind of melts. Live things, producing something live and then visualizing it and memorializing it so that it can extend and live on. I, I like the excitement of that. When, when my bands, when I was making records, and my bands went on the road, I would mix some of their live sound and stuff. I still like the buzz of that. I love the buzz of theater. I'm developing a stage show now with my friend Mark Wolper, who, you know, not chop liver, he's got 50 Emmys and two Academy Awards, and a guy named Joel Zwick, who directed um, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, which is a pretty big independent thing. He's got a ton of group. And we have, we have a play called Serrano. Our other partners are two producers from Extra, Steve Sunshine and David Giha. And that's exciting to me to give birth to that and to watch, grow, to watch us grow that. Hopefully we'll get it to Broadway. That's live. I love theater. Um, and I love doing live events. And the, at, at the, there's a model called Fathom. There's a business through National – well, it used to be National Cinemedia. Regal at um, – Cinemark and AMC own a division called Fathom, which does live events and events in theaters during the week. And I have relationships there, and I've been doing stuff with them for about 12 years. I love finding ways to do live events, capturing it, getting the public involved for a night. It's exciting to me, man. I, I still, I'm still all about goosebumps. It's amazing how you've got your area of expertise, but you've managed to find all these different avenues. So that there's, there's no repetition, <laughs> you know, you're, you're doing all these different types of things with your skills. The, Brian, the world is a convergence world. The brilliance of Netflix and Amazon giving people options to watch 13 episodes at one time when you watch House of Cards. The fact that Amazon has its distribution pipeline and they're building a studio. There's so many new ways to get content to the world. I'm a content guy. I just love creating the content and then exploring new ways to get it out there. But the fundamental principles are the same as when I was a kid at UCLA writing songs and wanting to get it out there. It's just there's different vehicles. I am a big admirer of a company called Vice who are changing the game because they're very disruptive and they're finding new ways to get content out in new avenues. And i, I got to tell you, man, it's exciting to me. I wish I could be here another 50 years to see the, where, where it all goes. I'm curious about one specific project that I see you did was you worked on Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And I ask you that because I have had Paul Taylor from Winger on the show. And I know that he, he did, he talked about how he did this, worked on the theme song for one or two seasons of that show. And I'm curious if you worked with him on that. Not really. I got brought in by ABC television to see if we could have a marketing propeller to get more kids to watch it by virtue of a soundtrack. And I said to the people at ABC and uh, Paula Joan Hart, whose daughter Melissa started it, I said, if you cameo people who are cool into roles on the show and the songs are cool and you weave them into the fabric of the show and you put a record out, the whole thing becomes congruent, that's an interesting thing. So they brought me in to be that quarterback. I had nothing to do with the theme song to the show, but I decorated a lot of the episodes with music. Then Geffen, we put a record out on Geffen Records, which wound up selling a million copies, and that was pretty cool. That's a, so it worked out for them quite well then. Oh, yeah. But I'm, I'm real. If I get brought into something, I'm not going to do it the way that 90 other people that interview for that gig will do it. I'm going to do it left to center. And if you don't dig it, I mean, there's so many. Listen, I've had a lot of failures in my career, but I look at them as noble failures because they're real cool ideas. If they're either too progressive or too different or too disruptive, so be it. But the ones that click like, you know, whether it be the, the one, some of the examples I've given you and some of the things I've done recently, it's really cool because it's not the same thing. Every, you're either, in this life, man, you're either a sheep or a shepherd. And I have this bad habit of liking to lead the pack. 
And so I do. And sometimes I get knocked down. But you know what? You get knocked down, you get right back up, and you keep going. And at what point do you decide it's time to abandon a project? I never abandon anything that I get, I get into. If I, if, if the only time I'll abandon it is if it goes out and it fails. Then I got to move on. But I'll see something through. If I cross the line, it's hard to get me to, you know, it's hard to get me pregnant into something because my standards are high and my passion is great. But once I cross the line, man, and I'm in, I'm in until I'm out. And I'm out when the thing doesn't go anywhere. If it's a project I'm developing and I can't sell it and I've exhausted everything, I will try, try, try until I get it done as I've done it throughout my whole career. If for some reason I hit a wall, I don't know. I mean, I'm very fortunate in that I don't give up. And that, I think that really, Brian, I think that really comes from being so poor. And there's a great line. My favorite line in any song, maybe in my lifetime, is a line in a Bob Dylan song from Like a Rolling Stone called, When You Ain't Got Nothing, You Got Nothing to Lose. And that's kind of how I live my life. I just keep going because I had nothing. So I just keep going and all I can lose is my time. But if I'm passionate about it, that's how I want to spend my time. Can you tell me about Meteor 17 and, and how did that get started? Well, Meteor 17 is a personification for everything we just talked about. Why the name Meteor is because my Billy Thorpe days being into space, understanding the you know, cosmos and all the existential extraterrestrial stuff has always been in my DNA. Also, my younger son, Morgan, um, who is now getting his pilot's license and actually got his single engine and his dual engine just the other day, um, was always into wanting to fly and always wanted to be in the ozone. I actually made a movie a couple of years ago down at space camp called Space Warriors, which is pretty cool. 17 was my sports number. It's my father's birthday and my older son Sterling's birthday. And that's my lucky number. So that was my number all through high school and college playing sports, you know, when I played baseball, football, and basketball. And um, it's my dad's birthday. It's Sterling. So Meteor 17 means nothing except a lot to me. And what kind of projects are you working on these days then? Go into my website, www.meteor17.com. I mean, it's, it's pretty diverse. I'm doing cool things that mean something to me. Whether I'm, a friend of mine, Martin Gee, he wrote a script on the first African American to become a star in, in the NBA, Sweetwater, Nathan Sweetwater Clifton, which he's partnered with the NBA in a marketing thing, and we're making that independently. I'm excited about that. I'm working with my friend Eddie Kramer, who used to engineer for Zeppelin, the Stones, the Beatles, and Hendrix. Eddie is, is my co EP, and I'm putting together with Sony Legacy an acoustic, unplugged version of Jimi Hendrix music bringing kids of today into classic Hendrix. So Graham Nash and, uh, Jay, and um, David Crosby worked with Jason Mraz to do an acoustic version of Angel. Um, Hart, who I think Ann Wilson, Nancy Wilson, two of the greatest talents I think in my lifetime, they did a beautiful version of Jimmy's Waterfall acoustically. It's just I'm very excited about that. We're, we've got this really visionary record. It's going to go out through Sony Legacy. I'm actually going to put it on the Pasha label. I haven't had a record on Pasha since the late 80s. But Adam Block is the CEO of Sony Legacy, and they do all the classic releases six months or older, you know, from whether it be Dylan or, or Neil Diamond or Santana or Stones or – not Stones, I'm sorry, or um, Simon Garfunkel. Anyway, all the great Columbia and Sony masters. And Adam is a really good guy, and he's very visionary. And I said, Adam – when I put this record together, it's important to me because it's a legacy project bridging generations. I want to kind of bring something that was important to me back and we'll put it out. You know, it'll have the Sony label, of course, but I want it to say Pasha. And that's, it's going to be interesting because nothing has been on the Pasha label since the days that I was making records in the 80s. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so I gave you a scoop. Nobody knows that. Anyway, there's another dozen things in the oven at Meteor that have different importance to me. 
whether it be a documentary on a song called I Hope You Dance and how that song has touched people's lives. And Graham Nash performs Teach Your Children. Brian Wilson performs God Only Knows. Maya Angelou talks about the power of music to touch people. Pastor Joel Osteen talks about the reach and the inspiration of music. And Vince Gill speaks to that. And then we uncovered stories of people whose lives have been changed. That will be a Christmas holiday special on a major network. That's important to me. I spent two years doing that. Brilliant director named John Scheinfeld directed that. John did the U.S. versus John Lennon, which was my favorite music doc. I mean, everything I'm involved with, Brian, I care about. Otherwise, I'm not going to get involved. That I find that very inspiring. It's, it's nice to see somebody who's stuck to his guns creatively and uh, only sticks with the, po- the projects that he's passionate about. Yeah, it's a bl- I'm telling you, Brian, it's a blessing and a curse. And the reason that it's a curse is um, (laughs) because not everything makes money. And so many of my peers are about the money. But I'm about the goosebumps first. Money is a byproduct of doing great work. So it's been a a positive and a negative. When it hits, it really hits. And when it doesn't, eh, it's a memory, but I'm still proud of it. So I stuck to my guns because I kind of have to. It's in my DNA. I would have made a lot more money and had a lot more um, whatever it is like some of my colleagues do. But I, I've got, I can look in the mirror and say I've been really proud of my ride. You know, It's got to be a lot easier to accept when a project fails if you were passionate about it so you, you can't regret the process of making it because you, you still created something you were passionate about. No question. Oh, I'm used to failure. I mean, I learned one thing, and when I was you know, giving lectures out at Syracuse where my older son Sterling went, I used to say no is the most commonly used word. Take, you know, get your seatbelt on, you're going to ride your roller coasters, get used to it. But you know what? I'm used to that, and as long as, you know, I know that it comes because I experienced it real young, and I just keep going because if I believe in it, I think there's something to it. And if not, you know what? I I can't think I wasted my time. I would waste my time if I would be doing work on stuff that I didn't really love or believe in. And I've never done that to my fiscal detriment. (laughs) But at the end of the day, you know, but it's okay because I've done okay. Because when I hit it, I really hit it. So it makes, it makes up for the other times. And, you know, now I'm going to, I'm trying to be a little smarter about that. But at the same time, if there's not passion, if I don't think it's something really cool and very visionary or interesting, I ain't going to do it. I don't care how much you give me. That was Spencer Proffer. I hope you liked it. Next week, I have an interview with another producer and somebody who was briefly mentioned by Spencer. I've got Tom Worman coming on the show. As always, you can reach me on Twitter at The Double Stop or at TheDoubleStop.com. I'll see you again next week.